and guests, I would like us to start today with a moment of silence because it is National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Day. And um, this, we need to honor those um, law officers who have lost their lives both because of this and for other reasons and also those who serve us. So I'd like to start with a moment of silence. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, can we start by having just a brief discussion of what happened yesterday on the floor? Um, I, I think, Brian, that you did a, a really good job of reporting it and of answering the questions. There was no question in my mind about that. I, I do not understand the the resistance here. And most of these already had their budgets prepared. I mean, they're not, their meetings were set for March 23rd and May 2nd, and they're not preparing new budgets. They've already got them prepared. They just can't meet. So, uh, so let's just debrief just a tiny bit about that. Who wants to weigh in? Well, well I, I I'll weigh in because I, I was, given that I represent one of the villages that still hasn't met, uh, I was going to jump in, but it's, uh, the Zoom context is uh, sort of awkward enough so that I, 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 I wanted to, to, to weigh in and, and mention Peter's comment about, particularly after Anne said they would double the budgets, when Peter had said specifically that often Brattleboro at the representative meeting double it, it adds to their budget. Uh, that, that it, you know, that there's no likelihood that, that anybody in this atmosphere and in this COVID context is going to be doubling a budget. That was, a, I thought, a bizarre thing to be talking about. But also, we, there are a lot of villages that, that do their meetings after town meeting, and, and we were set to go. And we're now put off till June sometime, and, and who knows this would have been very helpful for for the village of Woodstock, and I and I regret not having uh, stepped up and and said that in in the context of the floor. But I it was it's off anyway. I'm still getting used to floor action and speaking on the floor. Well, I will tell you one thing that I got a I got a note from Tim that said, well, maybe we should set a default for towns. And my response to that is we have no business doing that. The reason we have it, the, I did say we, that too. the reason we interfere with the, the education tax is because it's a statewide education tax. So whatever one town does has an impact on another town. But when you have municipal and village budgets, it only affects them. And we have no business, in my opinion, as the state telling them what they should do with their budget. So I don't know where the rest of you are on that or not, but I would, I will resist anything, any attempt to do that. So, Chris. Uh, sorry. Um, one, two things. One is, I was asked to step in and join uh, a meeting, quote unquote, in the pro tems office on something on Act 250. So I'd like to do that and come back. But the other thing is to weigh in, I agree with you completely on the direction that you're going. I, it would seem, uh, I, I never heard of just uh, starting to dictate budgets that way. And we elect people, we can unelect people, we count on them to use their, their judgment. And I don't know why we would get so involved in talking about municipal budgets other than to try to allow them to pass them. So, yes, yeah. I agree. Anthony and then Brian. Well, actually I wasn't there when this happened yesterday. I had to leave early in the floor to go to a doctor's appointment, but this was just to allow the towns to pass their budgets, right? Without having a full meeting. Is that what this is about? It would allow the select the legislative body to, to and there adopt was the a, budget. Yeah, to adopt the budget and set the tax rate. I guess yeah. that not having been there, I'm so surprised that there was so much resistance. It just seems weird. Yeah. Brian? Well, first of all, Madam Chair, I want to thank you for your support. Uh, 
with your comments today, but also on the floor yesterday. And I, I tried to make the point that we are talking only about municipal budgets. We weren't talking about school budgets or anything else. If that's an issue for people, then let that be in another bill or another way to handle it. All we were doing, in my view, was to afford those towns and villages who had not yet met the same flexibility that we gave to those that had met and wanted to take advantage of being able to change their municipal budget. It had nothing to do with education or even the penalties. All it was was to adopt a budget. So frankly, I didn't really understand the connection between that and school districts and everything else that um, Senator uh, Baruth brought up. Uh, if I can be a little indiscreet here, I am going to say that I think that when you reported it, Philip had a question, Senator Baruth had a question before we actually did the amendment. And I understand that. That's why I um, said, Mr. President, there is an amendment. And I, so once the amendment was passed and, or the, once we explained the amendment and it just took the wind out of the sails, but there had to be still resistance. That's the way I see this. I'm not sure how else to see it, but because there was concern if it could have impacted the schools. So I and guess that was a legitimate concern right. and Tucker took care of it. Yeah, and uh, I, I guess my question now is how do we address this going forward because I'd like to change opinions before our next vote in Tuesday, on Tuesday. Well, I, I think that, I mean, it will pass. There are a few people who might still vote against it. I would rather not have the debate on the floor again, but so, if we I, do, I, we're going to have to, I guess. I think it will pass and it will hopefully be on for, it will be on for third reading tomorrow. And there were some very specific questions that were asked of Brian, and we need to make sure that he has the exact answers, like what happens on July 1st if a town doesn't have a budget? They can't pay their bills, they can't collect taxes. Is that, so maybe we can have Karen and Tucker weigh in on that so that, Brian, you have the answers to those questions that right. were, that that would were be raised. Tucker, Karen, one of you jump in. So um, I can jump in this okay. Karen Horn. And um, thank you very much for your support on the floor yesterday, Senator Comer. I think you did a really good job. He did. Um, I did. I did just um, a few minutes ago try to call Senator Baruth and I will try to call Senator Hardy um, also and Senator Cummings um, to to ask them what you know what we can do to allay their fears. Uh, if you don't have a budget, you I don't believe you can assess taxes. Right. Um, so you're going to not be able to pay your employees or or and or any of your other obligations. Um, there are you know, as Senator Collimore said, a few villages that have um, later dates. Um, actually, Woodstock's is June 9th, Senator Clarkson. Yeah, no, I know. I live in the village. <laughs> yeah, oh, you do? Okay. I'm right and in the center of Woodstock. Some of them, some of them are actually doing mailing out absentee ballots to everybody. Some of them are working out how to do like drive-by voting, um, but several of them haven't made any decision yet uh, because it's complicated right now how you actually might um, get a vote together. I also wanted to mention that at two o'clock when I go to the House Education Committee, that's to address the legislation that came from the Senate around school districts that don't have budgets. So we're trying to keep those two issues very separate um, also. And uh, the municipal budget does not affect state revenues. It doesn't, it's not tied to budgets in other municipalities. So I wanna make that clear to the senators also. 
I believe that in addition to not being able to collect taxes, if you don't have a budget, as I remember from being on the Putney Select Board, you can't spend anything. So even oh, if right. you had a reserve, right. even if you had a reserve, you could not spend because it hasn't been authorized to be in the budget. So you couldn't, yeah. so come July, if your payroll was due on July 13th, you couldn't do it even if you had the funds. My understanding is it works the same way the state budget does. If you don't have a budget on right. July 1, you're dead in your tracks. Right. So I think that's a great response for all of our, to all of our colleagues. Well, whether it'll make any difference or not, I'm, we'll see. Well, it was a puzzlement to me. So the other, the other one that I, think is important and I may be wrong on this but the if I go backwards from June 30th to today I'm not sure there is time to warn um, a meeting anyway even if it was done by mailing out if you for example um, in Woodstock their meeting is set for July or for June 9th I think you said so they've already warned the meeting and they've already done that but new, uh, new Fane, I got an email from Chris Campany this morning, who's on the board of trustees. They, their meeting was set for May 2nd. They would have to rewarn, I believe, an election, a meeting to be held by mailing out because their meeting date has already passed. And I don't believe there's time for them to do that in order to have a vote by June 30th. I may be wrong about that, but this is um, May 15th. And by the time they got a warning put together and um, mailed out the warning or posted the warning, and then uh, I might be wrong, and then got ballots printed. So, no, it's, it's in some cases, they don't, they don't have ballots necessarily printed because they don't do them by Australian ballot. Like Brattleboro just does it by the town meeting vote at the town meeting. Right. So I believe they do. I think the smaller villages definitely do. So anyway, okay, well, Brian, do you feel comfortable enough to tomorrow to respond to a couple of those? Yeah, I do. I would ask either Tucker or Karen to just send me an email with um, with that, those thoughts. I think it was Cheryl Hooker that asked the question that sort of stopped the process. And that was the one about what if a town or a village doesn't have a budget by July 1st. So I could also reach out to her individually. And I think that might be a good way to do it. So that what I'm hoping is, assuming I get those pieces of information that we don't have any more questions and the third reading comes up and we vote on it and then we message it back right. to the other body quickly. I think that uh, Senator Hooker was trying to support you. Oh, she was. Okay. I think that was the intent of her question. Ah, okay. I didn't understand that, but now that you say it that way, okay. I think you probably will. I, I definitely think it was, yeah. Um, yeah. Madam Chair, I think Peter Elbow's yes. on the call also. He may oh, okay. Peter, do you want to weigh in? Um, thank you. And uh, thank you, Senator Collimore, for the leadership on behalf of the committee and um, Senator White for um, you know, leading the committee. Poking her nose in. All of you. Hello? I said for poking her nose in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and for all of you, um, we, we really appreciate the um, strong support that you're providing for this. You understand the situation and you're um, trying to convince the colleagues that are uh, that are showing uncertainty. So thank you for that. Um, I would just echo what uh, Karen has already said about the ability to just keep functioning. What we're talking about here is continuity of government, and um, you know, I, I obviously people can argue about the um, accountability of elected officials to their voters and whether individual elected officials or individual bodies might. Um, act in a way that others might view as irresponsible. But I think the bottom line is that um, select boards need to be accountable for that, like they're accountable for all their other actions. And in this moment, 
we, some of us, a handful of communities across the state, don't have a way forward to maintain continuity of government on July 1st and after. And you've got a nice, clear, simple solution to that that's near the finish line. And um, I appreciate that. If there's anything that we can do in terms of directly contacting the skeptical senators, um, please let us know and we're happy to do that. I would suggest perhaps that the, um, if any of those villages or towns that do not yet have a budget are in any of those um, jurisdictions that they contact the, or that they contact their senators regardless of which jurisdiction they're in. Yeah, Barry is in hand, so. Chris? Thank you. Uh, so let me know if you discuss this while I was away for 10 minutes. Um, one of the things that came up in the floor yesterday was the impact on the rest of the state should budgets be voted X, Y, or Z way. And uh, I didn't, you know, um, a senator said, well, because municipal and education rates are added to together, yes, there'll be an impact, but the, those, uh, to me, the, they've always been independent travelers and I don't see of any impact. So I just want to verify that setting the municipal rate is a municipal uh, impact only choice and that it's not going to have a potential deleterious effect on revenues of the state in some other way that I've never heard of before. I think that her, what her comment was, was that yes, but you add the two together and it affects your tax rate. She didn't actually say that it would impact the state education, but the implication was that because it affects the tax rate, but you're right, they are two separate tax rates. And when you get your tax bill, it says education municipal. Well, and, so. and this has always been true, at least mm -hmm. since I've been around. And, the select board members are incredibly sensitive to what they're asking their citizens to pay, knowing full well that it's going to stack on top of the education rate. So I don't, I don't know how there's anything new here that would merit constraining them. So Brian, I think that you just need to make sure that you have the answer to that so that you can stand up and clearly deflect that. I think I do. Thank you. All right, so do we need to do anything more about this issue? And I really apologize to uh, those communities out there. I, I think Brian did a great job. I, I was taken aback by the, by the resistance. Well, if I'd done an absolutely great job, it would have gone through on third reading and be now a, a situation the house was dealing with. Or if you'd done a really great job, there might have been more resistance. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so let's, um, I think we're okay on that. Um, Brian, if you have more questions or need more stuff from either Karen or Tucker, I'll, I'm gonna I'll leave just, it. Yeah, I'll, I'll let them know by email right now what I need. Thank okay, you. and Anthony, you should get a rundown on it sometime. It was pretty interesting. So thank you, Karen, you, Peter. You can always go back and stream it. <coughs> oh, right. <laughs> it, it, if you do that, it's the last 10 minutes of the meeting. Right. You know, to tell you the truth, after being on Zoom all day, the last thing I'm going to do afterwards is go on YouTube to watch us do it again. <laughs> Come it's on. Friday night. I think I'll find something else to do. Oh, yes. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right, but thank Senate, you for this suggestion, Karen. Yeah, Senate floor is must see viewing. <laughs> On Friday night, it's it's yeah. your viewing pleasure. Okay, so let us now, um, we also talked right before we get into the law enforcement thing we're talking about is, um, we talked about next week's schedule. We apparently are going back to our regular floor schedule, Tuesday at nine, Wednesday at one, Thursday at one and or Tuesday at nine thirty, and Friday at eleven thirty. So what we talked about was this committee meeting Tuesday from one to four thirty, and I know that's a long time, and we'll try to keep it shorter, but we can also take like a ten minute break 
in between. And in judiciary, Senator Sears always gives us a break in the middle and they just, um, Peggy somehow puts it on, just mutes it and puts little pictures up in front of everybody. So she turns off the video. And, and then Wednesday from after the floor till four, 4.30 and Thursday the same. And then Friday from one to three or four, whatever we need. Does that work? Anthony? Is Chris gone away again? Oh. No, no, I'm here saying oofa. Um, oofa. I think, yeah, oofa. Two no, hours and two again. hours of zooming oofa. is like the maximum for a human brain, but whatever. I know. <laughs> so well, we'll uh, try to keep it shorter because uh, I think we're in pretty good shape. Maybe, maybe we could schedule Tuesday uh, one to four. That's already adding yeah. a whole okay. hour. Okay. And that's three hours straight. That's and we, we may not need it. So I do, okay. yeah, one to four, and then end of, yeah, I think the other okay. bit's great. And then Friday, we'll just do one to three. We won't schedule one to four. That's silly. Okay. All right. So the um, things we have to do next week is, I think we need to look at some budget things that um, if there's a, uh, budget issues from the departments that we deal with that they um, want to request in the budget adjustment other than EMS. So I'll put a word out to um, public safety and emergency management, Erica, and um, the treasurer's office, and just see if there are any budgetary issues that that they need feel they need addressed in but budget adjustment. And then the court has asked us to look at one issue around the judiciary that has to do with government operations. I'm not even sure what it is, but Pat Gable just sent me a note. So I'll talk to her and we'll put that on for Tuesday. Okay. So let's go now to um, 124. Betsy, are you with us still? Hey, Betsy Ann. Hello. So what I thought we would do here is we took out um, a bunch of stuff from 124 when we did the EMS, but the, we, there are some things in here that are not COVID related, but should pass. So I thought we would go over some of those, particularly today around the law enforcement, because I think that's about what's left. So Betsy had sent us, and is it on today's document? The yes. Yeah, there's Thank something you, in the back. Of there is a yeah. There's a summary of S124 as was originally passed out of Senate GovOps. You may is have it to on to refresh your page. Refresh, refresh your browser. So as you look at the summary. Oh, one, there though, it is. Yeah. Betsy? Okay. I guess I yeah, went in. Yeah, that's early. probably the easiest. Okay. All right. So, do you want to kind of walk us through that so we can see? And I'm not sure who we have with us um, around this. I'm trying to look at the participant list here. We have, it looks like uh, 1802, whoever that is, Drew, Matt Birmingham, Nolan, Mark Anderson. I don't know who that pink person is. Oh, Gwen, maybe. Anyway, okay. So let, do you want to walk us through, start walking us through this? And I actually think Vince Aluzzi was going to join us also. Did you send him an invite, Gail? Yes, I did. Okay, thanks. Okay. Betsy, do you, right. Betsy Ann, do you want to start us? Sure. For the record, Betsy Ann Rask, Legislative Council. So as you recall, S-124 
um, as passed out a Senate GovOps on the last day that we were in the State House together, um, addressed law enforcement, dispatch, EMS, and public safety planning. Uh, you pulled out some of the EMS provisions for what became S-182, which the governor signed yesterday, um, but none of the law enforcement uh, provisions were um, taken out of S-124, so none of those have uh, moved since you last um, addressed them. So this summary uh, that is up here just gives a high level overview of what those law enforcement proposed amendments were. And if we're looking at this together here on page one, it starts out with proposed amendments in regard to the Criminal Justice Training Council. And um, section one is just a, a technical correction. Section two get into uh, more substantive changes, specifically amending the membership of the council. So big picture what this would do, it would take the council from 12 to 16 members. It would specify who 13 of those members are, and then it would provide the governor, Senate and house with each, uh, each having one public member appointee who doesn't have a law enforcement connection. Do you want me to pause after each one, Madam Chair, for discussion, or you just want me to go through them? What, what would what would be your preference, Committee, to just um, look at each one as we go through, so that we can um, decide where we want to be, and that might make more sense. It might be more time effective. Yes. Okay, or time efficient, rather effective, efficient. Okay. So I have had a request from uh, the head of law enforcement in the DMV to have to, because I had suggested adding um, somebody from Fish and Wildlife and then had a request to also add uh, the head of enforcement from DMV. Oh, were they talking about the law enforcement advisory board? Oh, that's the law enforcement advisory board, not here? Yes, uh, so okay. the commissioner, commissioner of motor vehicles is already on the council. You did add, or that's you proposed to add um, the head of fish and wildlife enforcement to the LEAB. LEAB, okay, yeah. great, okay, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. So I guess I have not, anybody have any comments on this? Um, Matt, uh, Mark, anybody out there, would you like to weigh in? I'm not hearing anybody. Am I missing anybody? No. Okay, I guess we're okay with section two as we have it in the bill. Okay. All right, then the bill gets into the topic of having different training options for law enforcement officers. Um, section four would require the council to adopt rules regarding alternate routes to certification, aside from the training provided at the police academy. <clears throat> And also the not, not sounding good. Yeah. Is that courses? Be Betsy, you're cutting out, I think. Hey, Betsy, Betsy, can you hear us? Yeah. You we cannot understand you. It's going, it sounds I like can. it sounds can everybody else understand her? No, it, it was like something like from Star Wars. <laughs> or, or one of those um, uh, washboard um, things that you pull the twang on. I sound fine to myself. <laughs> <laughs> sound fine. <laughs> now you sound okay. Okay, we'll try it again. Maybe it's my internet connection. It, Am I still was, okay? It, it was your internet. Okay. Connection. It was like slow-mo. <laughs> All right, well, tell me okay. if it happens again. Uh, did you hear me on section four about the alternate routes or alternate training? Not really. Okay, so I'll start over. Section four would require the council to adopt rules regarding alternate routes to certification, aside from the training provided at the police academy. 
and it would require the council to strive to offer courses in different areas of the state and non overnight courses when possible. Your second Any comments mm, sorry, on that? Nope. Uh, I, I, I would say this, this incorporates one of our lessons learned, which is we need to be building flexibility and alternate training paths and alternate everything um, as we look to be resilient and respond to unforeseen circumstances in state government. So I think actually this supports uh, a, a lot of our lessons learned out of the uh, COVID crisis. And I believe if I'm not mistaken, I believe that the, um, they're already working on this. So this just would reinforce it and actually put it some does. fire under the feet. So, right, yes, okay. I... okay. All right. Can I, Anthony? Yes, maybe you already said, I'm just, this is not a big deal, but remind me what LEO and CLEP are. Oh, uh, LEO is law enforcement officer. That's just the abbreviation I use. Okay. And then that, what was the other one? CLEP. Oh, CLEP. Yeah, that's the CLEP learning. Uh, what is that? College? It, it's like, it's um, lifelong learning. You can apply lessons learned by either your job oh, or okay. by just being alive and breathing. And you have to justify them, but that's what it is. Yeah. That's the way we got to college, right? John, Johnson, Johnson State had an external degree program that um, was heavily involved in that. Thanks. Yes, specifically, it stands for College Level Examination Program. And that's in Section 5. So that, that's um, Section 5 is in regard to the ability of an officer to transition from Level 2 to Level 3. Remember, the issue right now is that the way the council programs are set up um, is that if you're Level 2, you have to completely restart the training over again to become level three. So this section five would require the council to restructure its programs so that next July, um, a level two officer could use portfolio experiential learning or that CLEP testing to get to level three without having to restart the process. Okay. All right. Section six is just a report back on how that's going. Um, uh, were there any questions first on section five or six? Then from anybody out there, uh, I see no committee members raising their hands. How about anybody else out there? Supportive, non-supportive questions? Uh, Senator White, it's uh, Mark Anderson. Thank uh, you. Overall, uh, uh, so Mark Anderson, Sheriff of Wyndham County for the record. Uh, I'm also a member of the Criminal Justice Training Council. Um, I'm not here to speak on behalf of the council uh, and Sheriff Boniak uh, is currently tied up with uh, an emergency so he can't attend right now but I hope he can join eventually. Uh, overall in my conversations with various people um, on the council and within law enforcement there's not really too much that's um, I would say is controversial in those sections. Okay thank you. All right, moving right along. All right, um, section seven is mostly a clarification, but it just makes explicit that one law enforcement agency can seek certification from the council for any in-service training it provides not only to its own officers, but officers of another agency. So for example, Vermont State Police might provide training and then if officers that are not within VSP take that training, they can get credit for that uh, training that VSP provides if they get certified, VSP gets certification from the council. Any questions or concerns about that? Okay, okay. moving right so along. To the top of page two, this, this is about uh, a requirement for a potential hiring law enforcement agency to contact an officer's current agency to get an analysis of the officer's performance at that agency. I'm gonna so, bug out here for one second. Okay. So you already put in the law, it's already a requirement that a potential hiring agency has to contact the officer's former agency if the officer's 
no longer employed there. But what this would do is add on to that requirement to say, if an officer is still employed at an agency and is looking for work elsewhere, the potential hiring agency has to contact that current agency um, to get an analysis of the officer's performance at that agency. Um, and there's a transitional provision in section nine that would waive this requirement um, in case there's an existing non-disclosure agreement that would prohibit this disclosure. Um, but then once that um, non-disclosure agreement terms ended, uh, an agency or an officer would be subject to this, uh, uh, this requirement. And I think we, Brian. So if I'm, I'm just trying to think of an example, Betsy. So if I work for the Woodstock Police Department, but I'm interested in moving to the Hartford Police Department, I better make darn sure that the Woodstock Police Department is aware that I've made application or they're gonna go, in essence, not behind my back, but they're, they're going to be contacting my current Woodstock employer and it would put me in an awkward position if I wasn't up front about it, correct? Yes, and actually the, the language in the statute first requires the officer to execute a written waiver that explicitly authorizes the potential hiring agency to contact the current agency. So mm -hmm. there will be that explicit agreement. Yes, go ahead and contact my current agency. Um, but you're right, the big picture is the officer's gotta be comfortable with that idea of the potential hiring agency contacting their current employer. Thank you. Allison? Uh, I have, um... Well, the plus of the, there are a couple pluses uh, there. You remember the poaching issue that we have dealt with is big. And so this, this I would hope would sort of um, reduce some of the, the poaching one agency from another. I guess my question really came with the non-disclosure agreements. I mean, to me, that would be a red flag as an employer looking at an employee. If there was a something I couldn't see or something I couldn't understand about that was in a non-disclosure agreement. Um, I'm not sure I fully un understand why, I can't remember this conversation about why we needed this section nine. Um, as I remember, and I would ask um, maybe Matt or Mark to weigh in on this, um, was I remember um, currently what happens is this is, we have done the same thing around educators over the past couple of years, is that you currently, you are not um, required to contact the current employer. So if you have somebody who's a bad apple and wants to move someplace else, there's no way of knowing that. So we heard early on from the, when we were dealing with the COVID stuff that this was considered a necessary pass, but not related to COVID. So I would just ask um, Mark and Matt if you wanted to weigh in on this just a bit. I, I certainly can, uh, if that's okay, Madam Chair. Yes, please. Uh, for the record, Matt Birmingham, Director of the State Police. Uh, we currently, uh, the State Police currently um, requests and requires a waiver from every applicant for past employment records. Uh, so we're already doing this as a matter of practice. Um, so I can only say that I um, support it and I think it's very important. Uh, I think it's important too. So this is a, this enables you to actually understand the non-disclosure agreement. I, do you wanna comment on that? I think a non-disclosure agreement is there are some who currently have non-disclosure agreements. And this is just grant saying that this does not apply to those who already have a non-disclosure agreement in place. Is that, do I understand that right? Because there are some, some people who as part of their, um, they might've negotiated, uh, yes, I will do this, but you can't, we're gonna have this agreement. and non-disclosure agreements are relatively common in the employment world. And um, so I think all this does is grandfathers, those that currently have them. Oh, is that what this does? I believe so. 
So it, oh, yes. Okay. Yes, okay. and it's it's just a temporary provision, just in case, right. as you were describing, Madam Chair, if when an officer is working at his or her current agency, when they started that employer-employee relationship, if if in some case they had some sort of agreement that you're not going to employer, you're not going to disclose my performance at this at this agency, just in case that exists. Um, you had the same exact language that's in section nine. That same language appeared when you originally enacted the requirement for a potential hiring agency to contact the officer's former agency. So it's a repeat of that language that was enacted um, when this statute was originally um, suggested or proposed. Madam Chair, yes. uh, I'd be happy to speak to it as well if, if you Thank like. Thank you. Yeah, um, please. So similar to uh, what Colonel Birmingham said, we also do a waiver for hires. Uh, the issue regarding poaching, this would certainly help uh, in, as it would require uh, an agency head uh, to reach out. Um, as you know, the training process is long, which also requires us to commit a lot of time to planning. And what we have found, especially with a shortage in personnel, is that uh, a two-week notice and or shorter in some cases uh, might be all an agency head gets with a requirement to train. So uh, this would help, at least in terms of planning, that uh, these processes usually do take a while uh, to hire. Uh, and so it would allow an agency head to be aware of that. Another part uh, that, as I'm reading it, uh, and I've, as I, excuse me, as I've reviewed it over uh, the last week, is also the ability uh, to allow uh, agency head uh, relief to uh, share openly and honestly about issues that they may have had with a person. Uh, there's, uh, well, I think Vermont is very good at uh, dealing with uh, inappropriate action uh, and to include the you know, the criminal charges up in, I think it was St. Albans uh, most recently. Uh, there's also a possibility that a person who's undergoing a, a current criminal investigation or a current internal investigation is entitled to some protection of confidentiality, or it might be uh, in the best interest of the state not to release certain information uh, because of the active investigation. Um, there's also lawsuits that happen, and I can't speak specifically to union type issues because I don't have a union, but there's a uh, uh, I imagine there can be issues regarding union grievances and uh, talking about issues that a, a current agency is having uh, with, uh, with a person where they would uh, essentially say, we're not going to share that information with the, uh, the hiring agency uh, because of a concern of a lawsuit that they would prevent them from getting hired elsewhere. Thank you. Okay. Um, Can I just ask, said, Betsy, why yeah, it, oh, says it says it's a transitional provision. What do we mean by, I mean, I know what transitional means, but does it mean it's going to expire at some point in terms of overall, or is it just about the individuals? You're muted. You're muted. Thanks. Uh, it's just the language in section nine of the bill says that that requirement of the current law enforcement agency to disclose its analysis of the law enforf enforcement officer's performance at that agency, quote, shall not apply if there is a binding non-disclosure agreement prohibiting that disclosure that was executed prior to the effective date of that section. So it's just not applying this uh, disclosure requirement if at the time that this takes effect or would take effect, there's a non-disclosure uh, agreement in effect that would prohibit it. So it's transitional and that it only applies to those current existing non-disclosure agreements if they exist. Okay. But then okay. Once that disclosure agreement um, ended, because it wouldn't carry on in perpetuity. Um, okay. Or may not. It, it just wouldn't apply to those. So it's a contracts it. clause, essentially. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any more questions or concerns about section nine or uh, eight? May I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, is this limited to state of Vermont agencies? For example, if the state of New Hampshire is trying to steal one of my uh, mm -hmm. employees and uh, the chief calls me and says, hey, we're looking to hire this person, 
would I have protection under this? Yeah, so the, the language in the bill specifically says it, it only applies to the state of Vermont law enforcement agencies because we can't control um, whether New Hampshire will uh, disclose. So the language actually says if the current or former agency is an agency in this state, the agency has to disclose. Um, but we can't control whether or not New Hampshire discloses. But does it tell me to disclose to New Hampshire? Uh, I don't think by the language of this, I think that would be dis a discretionary discretionary on the uh, Vermont agency's part. Um, let's see. Just look, looking at the actual text of the language. I think it says if the current or former agency is a law enforcement agency in the state of Vermont, that uh, you have to disclose to the potential hiring agency. Um, and it said it just says potential hiring agencies. My under if I read that, if New Hampshire is calling you, asking you you have to disclose to New Hampshire because that's a potential hiring agency. And it doesn't say that the potential hiring agency is in the state of Vermont. But if, if you're calling New Hampshire, they don't have to disclose to you. But the way, I, am I wrong, Betsy? I think that's a fair reading. I mean, I think it's set up to really kind of focus on Vermont officers and Vermont agencies. But yeah, I, I see. Uh, I, I, I'm reading it the same as you now, Madam Chair, going back to it. Um, it does say just in plain text that if the agency's in, in this state, they have to disclose the to the potential hiring agency their analysis of the officer's performance. So just I probably would be a matter of whether the New Hampshire agency contacts Vermont, the Vermont agency. So Allison. So I understand that it would we can't make uh, policy that affects other state agencies, but uh, other states, I mean. Um, but sh could we, in that instance that Mark brings up, could we require that an employee who is considering a job in another agency outside the state uh, require that they let their employer know? I don't think you can future employer out of the state? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's basically giving notice to the current employer that I'm actually up for a job in another state and giving them time to either counter offer or, uh, or whatever. But it gives them to go back to the poaching issue and the time frame and the investment we've made in these people to have other people take advantage of, of, of our investment is always frustrating. I, 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 um, it does say that an officer has to um, give the uh, executed a written warrant shall not be hired by the potential hiring agency, but I don't know that we can hold a New Hampshire agency. I, I, I'm not, I'm talking about the employee. No, I, I know, but I'm not sure that we could require an that might be a, a labor relations law. I'm not sure. Uh, question. I'm not sure we could require. Any, no, I was, yeah. I was just any more than we can with anybody else. Right. I don't know the answer offhand. I mean, it, on the one hand, Vermont law can control current Vermont law enforcement officers, but I would want to speak with our labor attorney about any yeah. issues with requiring our current state law enforcement officers to disclose something to another state. I just, I don't have yeah. the easy answer. Or, I'm not talking about disclosing it to another state. I, I'm trying to protect our own Vermont agencies. Oh, to alert, so that a to Vermont alert state them law enforcement that somebody, officer. It, exactly, to go to Mark's point, you know, if, if you can't affect the New Hampshire agency that's poaching your officer, maybe you can affect the officer giving you notice 
and a heads up or what you know whatever might work within the labor relations um context we, we should check with damien on that yeah. but i i would be very skeptical about whether we can require a law enforcement officer any more than any other employee in the state of that works for i don't think we require um if a state employee is right. applying for a job in new hampshire i don't think we could require them to notify well, but what what's unusual here is that we the state and or the municipality or whatever has paid for their training i mean we have an investment in these people in i understand way. that yeah but we could say the same thing about anybody we give a any college student or anybody that we give a um a scholarship to or uh, state training, if we send them to leadership training, if we send them to, so, I mean, I, I would just check with Damien. Okay. okay. I'll follow up with okay. him. Did I hear somebody else or was that a train? Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Let, you'll check on that, Betsy. Yes. Okay, so now we go to ch chapter two. Yeah, well, we're getting into unprofessional conduct now. Um, one of the first things that this section does, this section 10, is just in regard to category B conduct. When the statute currently defines category B conduct, it says that ca category B conduct includes conduct that amounting to actions, misconduct amounting to actions under a color of authority, um, and then it says such as. So the first thing the bill does is substitutes for such as says shall include because this list that follows the current laws such as A through E includes things such as sexual harassment um, that involves physical contact or misuse of position, <laughs> excessive use of force, bias enforcement. So it's a clarification instead of using such as which seems to imply that these may be examples, but not necessarily. It's saying, no, they shall include the list that's already set forth in A, A through E. Right. Um, so that we know that these are definitely examples of category B conduct. And using include means it's not an exhaustive list. So it could include other things, but it at least includes what's already listed here in A through E. Me? Yeah, it is. The next thing that this does is addresses again category B and says that category B conduct includes excessive use of force first offense rather than excessive use of force second offense. And we discussed this how this has kind of a ripple effect, a triple whammy, if you will. Betsy, do <laughs> <hear> your thing. <laughs> um, for the effects that this has throughout the chapter, the subchapter on unprofessional conduct. Um, there, I listed a few of these, uh, or the ones that stick out really, um, what the changes this would make in the summary. Um, one of the things is that the agencies are not, they um, report category B conduct to the council. Well, if category B conduct is defined to mean excessive use of force second offense instead of first offense, it's meaning the council's not finding out about allegations of first offenses of category B conduct. So it's hard for the council to track whether an officer is alleged to have committed excessive use of force. Then um, also an agency is supposed to report whether an officer is terminated for category B conduct. And so if an agency terminates an officer for a first offense, uh, of excessive use of force, the council by law doesn't ha have to be made aware of that. Um, another thing that it does is that um, the council cannot discipline an officer for a first offense of category B conduct. So if right now, if category B is excessive use of uh, force second offense, what that really means in practice is the council cannot take action until the third known offense of excessive use of right. force. 
So just by substituting first offense for second offense, um, it's just making the council more aware of potential excessive use of force by officers and their ability to uh, take action if necessary for excessive use of force. And they could do so for an actual second offense of excessive use of force. Okay. And this was something that the council requested. Any questions on the triple whammy? And <laughs> when, when we report this on the floor, we're going to ask Betsy to stand, be, well, I was going to have her stand in the front of the, uh, the chamber and wave her arms around. But <laughs> I guess we can't do that because we won't be in the chamber. Maybe I can zoom in there somehow. Okay. <laughs> the zoom bomb, is that what it's called? Uh, yeah, I don't want a zoom bomb. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any questions or concerns about that section? Um, nobody, Matt, Mark? No, Madam Chair, if I could say one thing, though. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Matt Birmingham, uh, Director of the State Police. I just want to, I, I don't think the commissioner and I were, were under the understanding that this would, this bill would be reviewed today. So I wasn't completely prepared oh. to discuss it and, and he is unavailable. So I, I would just ask that um, that he be given an opportunity to weigh in on on this, as he is uh, the DPS representative on the council, and I do not want to speak for him today. I haven't had a chance to um, to touch base with him, so I'm, I just want to make sure I get that on the record. Got it. Thank you. Okay. And so I guess, Madam Chair, may I ask a question? Mm -hmm. I'm yes, still. I'm still concerned about first offense, um, you know, and, and sadly, you know, so Betsy Ann, could you just remind me, cause I know we discussed this at length in committee, but what the action after first offense in agency can take action against, you know, about this, about a first offense, I mean, right? It just yeah. isn't reported, is that right? Yes, it's an agency can definitely take action against an officer for a first offense of excessive use of force. This is really about the council regulating law enforcement officers because while an agency itself can terminate or suspend or condition the officer's practice, it's that only affects the officer's practice at that agency. The council is like OPR, it regulates the certification of the officer. And so the council has the authority to limit or restrict an officer's ability to practice for unprofessional conduct. And if they don't get reported, right. they can't do it until the third time. Right, yeah. right. I know, I know we corrected that. I just, I, I, guess, I guess that gives somebody an opportunity to, 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 to uh, take that on board and, you know, the, I, I guess second offense is the right. I just did bother, it, anyway. Right. Well, they're not, the council isn't going to take action until on the, first, on the first offense, it's just reported to them so that on the second, actual second offense, they will know that it's the second right. offense and they can take action. Right, no, so I'm, if they're, if they're never notified, if they're never notified of the first offense, and there's a second offense and then they're notified that's the first offense to the right. council so they can't take action no. until the third offense. I remember this discussion. I think it's essential that a first offense uh, be noted. Okay, are you are you okay with this then? I'm. Yeah, I'm just, you know, it's been a while since we talked about it. I'm just refreshing. Okay. You know, I, I'm just thinking about it. Okay, yep. Okay, so um, Matt, we will, we are going to schedule this again next week for, uh, we wanted to start going through it today and um, we'll schedule it again next week for a final um, review and vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. I'll let the commissioner know. I'm, I'm yep. taking notes as we go through for him, but that uh, just if we could make sure he gets on the invite list, I appreciate it. And, and, I, <laughs> and I believe that he weighed in while we were working on this. 
Yes. I, I, I think he initially did, Senator. I think he'd just like to loop back around with you all again yeah. um, for the for this latest version, just to make sure he has a voice in some of this as it is really at his level. And so we'll what we'll do is we'll make sure that um, everybody <clears throat> involved gets a, a copy of what we think might be our final bill. At, after we take out, uh, we'll have Betsy take out the things that need to be taken out and then, um, or write an amendment taking them out since that's probably the way we'll have to do it because we don't have control of the bill anymore. And then, um, may, and also have perhaps send out Betsy's um, summary here to people. Okay. All right, let's go on. Oh. Did somebody uh, else have Mark Anderson, Hello? County yeah. Sheriff. Uh, yeah. I'd also like to make sure that Chief Brickell, the chair of the Training Council, yeah. invited as well. Um, he's in another meeting right now, but he uh, does have some concerns he'd like to relay to the council. I'm sorry, to the to the committee. Okay, thank you. Well, we will do that. Okay, so are we going on now to? Uh, section 11? Uh, not just the almost there. I'm at the top of page three. The summary, the okay. last issue in regard to category B conduct is el oh, yeah. eliminating the current law language that an agency only report to the council alleged category B conduct if it is deemed credible by the executive officer of the agency as a result of a valid investigation. Um, the overall rationale for the, again, this was um, recommended by the council. And the overall rationale is that under the current law, the council might not be made aware of all complaints of law enforcement officer conduct that right, might rise the level of category B conduct because it's contingent upon the agency deeming the complaint credible and conducting a valid investigation to do so. So by eliminating that language about the agency deeming it credible first before it gets reported, um, the council would be made aware of allegations of category B conduct, and then could thereafter check in with the agency on the agency's, um, the status of the agency's investigation of that complaint. And it would provide the council with more oversight of a complaint against an officer and the agency's valid investigation of it. Any uh, questions about this section? I think a lot of this um, tracks with the way OPR does it, if I'm not mistaken. Well, the big difference, big difference is that under law enforcement officer regulation, each individual law enforcement agency, yeah. for the most part, is essential, uh, uh, the one that conducts the investigation. And then the council does have the um, ultimate authority to take action against an officer certification, whereas OPR has independent investigators that investigate allegations of law enforcement or of uh, professionals on professional conduct. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay. All right, now see. we're on section 11. <laughs> okay. So this is in regard to the state treasurer proposing a plan to the GovOps committees to place municipal police officers that are covered, currently covered under the municipal employees retirement system on a new retirement plan that's substantially equivalent to the one that covers our law enforcement officers, officers under the state employees retirement system, except for the health and medical benefits that are available under the state employee retirement system. I think we need to have some more conversation about this section because I, I do know that, uh, and I'd like to find out where the treasure is in terms of um, the group C um, committee that's looking at group C um, and, and then her ability to then um, do this in addition to that. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so 12. All right, then we get into the Vermont Crime Information Center. Um, Section 12 would require VCIC to establish and provide training on a uniform list of definitions for officers to use when they're entering data into their agency system of records, which could be Spillman or Valcor. 
and then would require every officer to use those VCIC definitions. So there's at least uniformity in how crimes and crime, criminal information is being reported because it all feeds up right into the, for example, to the FBI. Is that right? Yeah. And I believe we heard from Jeff Wallen that they are working on that. I know that there's a bias related bias incident, bias related incident reporting group that's working on coming up with standard definitions for that. So I think we just need to make sure we have standard definitions. I will hear from Jeff Wallen again about uh, this. Okay. And then still in regard to VCIC, section 13 would require VCIC to disseminate on a quarterly basis to the legislative body of every town that doesn't have a police department, uh, a report that describes the nature of the crimes that are alleged to have been committed in the town within the last quarter um, without any personally identifying info. So that I think the big picture just came from your law enforcement road show um, so right. that towns are made more aware of the crimes that are alleged to be happening in their town if they don't have their own PD. Right. We never want to hear that nothing like that happens here ever again. <laughs> Okay, any questions or concerns on that? And we'll hear from Jeff Wallen on that one also. All right, then on page four, we get into the Law Enforcement Advisory Board. One of the things that this is doing is just putting the LEAB in the correct place in law where it should exist. It should exist in Title 20. Right now it's in Title 24. But the substantive uh, changes to the LEAB are adding two members. Um, one, the director of the enforcement division of the Department of Fish and Wildlife, like you were referencing at the beginning, Madam Chair. And uh, the other one is an officer appointed by the VSEA. <laughs> Yeah, um, and this is, yeah, this is where I guess the DMV wanted. I was mistaken on that. So any issues on this one? Okay. Should I go ahead and plan for the DMV to be added as a member? I, I, I don't see any reason why not to. Okay. How, Anybody, how uh, Brian? Brian? How many people are on it now? Yeah. Let's see, I think. I want to say like 13. I think it's it's moved up here. I can tell you in a sec. So there's currently 14. Yeah, this would bump it up to 16. And some of them we heard were members, but don't go unless there's something on the agenda that is of interest to them. So it just provides for all voices to be on the advisory board. And it's just an advisory board. Mm -hmm. How is the DMV not already represented, I guess, is what I would ask. They're just not. They, they have a unique perspective. I'm not against it, I'm just asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is created within the Department of Public Safety. So maybe it was just considered more of a DPS issue, um, but it has a variety of members. Um, under current law, it includes the Commissioner of Public Safety, Director of VSP, and then, it, but it has representation from uh, Chiefs of Police, Municipal Police, Sheriffs, BLCT, a member of the Police Association, the Attorney General, a state's attorney, the U.S. attorney, criminal justice training council, the defender general, a rep of the troopers association, and a constable. <laughs> <laughs> now, are you happy, Brian? Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> now that the constables are on there. Yeah, I like my constable. I know. We all like <laughs> our constables. I'm fine with adding them, I guess. Or... Adding DMV? Okay. Yes. All right. And then the other thing that this does in regard to the LEAB is to require them to report in 2021 on how towns can increase access to law enforcement services. All right, let me move on. Yep. 
The next issue this bill addresses is the Department of Public Safety and Dispatch. Um, starting in section 18, one of the things that is happening here is some technical corrections to get rid of outdated language. For example, it would eliminate language that says the commissioner gets appointed for a term of six years. That's not how it works anymore. It also eliminates that statute that purports to say that the governor can only uh, remove the commissioner if the governor uh, file presents charges, there's a hearing, and um, there's the governor can only remove the commissioner for cause. This has been sitting there since 1979, even though the Vermont Supreme Court in that year said that this statute was superseded because all governor appointees serve at the governor's pleasure. But the big thing that's going on in this section 18 is requiring the commissioner of public safety to adopt rules that provide the rates for the Department of Public Safety charges to perform dispatch functions. And then also to adopt rules to regulate the technical and operational standards that apply to any entity that performs dispatch. So those are two important uh, rules there that would be required to be adopted by the Department of Public Safety. Where and I think we? they actually have done the first one on rates. They, they're working on that. You know, my preference here is to not have them doing dispatch at all, but at least this is a step in the right direction. Uh, in accordance with section 19, those rules would need to be adopted by July 1, 2021. Any questions, concerns, comments? Madam Chair, may I speak to that? Yes. Uh, Mark Anderson, Wyndham County Sheriff. Uh, with regards to uh, section two regarding uh, rules regu regulating the technical and operational standards that shall apply to any entity performing dispatch, I have concerns that the Department of Public Safety um, could establish things that would go beyond the relevance of my agency or the dispatch services that we provide. Um, as most of you are aware, we provide a contract dispatching service. Um, we do that within, uh, within that uh, realm. We've been doing it for many years and I think that we've been providing a professional service. I'm not sure that I need the Department of Public Safety uh, to designate how I do that. I would almost think that um, there's a closer relation to the training council than there would be to DPS. I, I, we, we should talk more about that. I think the, the issue here was that if we, if we move to more regional um, dispatch services, that um, there needs to be some standard of providing those services, both technical and um, operational, and who should set those standards. If you, you don't want the podunk area to, to be providing a lesser robust and um, effective <clears throat> dispatch service because nobody, there are no standards for it. So I, I, my guess is that anybody who is currently providing dispatch services probably would already meet any, we're talking about floor standards here, I think. Are we not committee? I wasn't sure what it meant. Remember we had this conversation about who, and we had it with 911 board with um, Barb O'Neill yeah. about somebody r making some standards for um, dispatch services and if if there is a more regional approach for both call taking and dispatch how do who's going to set some standards for that who's going to there, there needs to be some oh there needs some, to be some, yeah I agree and and I think but we can talk about whether it is the commission's the um, department's role or I'm not sure that the training council would, because we're talking about dispatch here, not just for law enforcement, we're talking about um, more all, dispatch, right, the all. ability to have more dispatch. So we can talk about who that, who should be the most appropriate 
Um, we had thought maybe it was the E911 board, but they they felt not. So let's flag that for some more discussion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right, that takes you through the law enforcement office, uh, law enforcement provisions of the bill. Then the bill okay. moves into EMS. The, may, I, may I ask a question, Madam Chair? Yes. So, um, and I, I acknowledge that we're rebooting on this. It might, we, we haven't sort of thought about this for a, a few weeks. Um, I'd like to go back to section 17 and uh, which has the LEAB specifically recommending ways that towns can increase access to law enforcement services. Were we thinking that that was code for looking at uh, and, sugge and suggesting ways we could uh, do more pilots or do something on, on, on regional uh, emergency services? I, I am not sure that it's code for anything. It's just mm -hmm. saying they should come up with some ideas about how how the um, towns can increase their access. Towns that right. don't have access. Yeah, and, and I, it, it, could we underscore or reinforce uh, the hope that may, maybe the LEAB would be looking at and recommending ways we might move towards a regional law regional I, I think we do we do that later on where we have right. some um, with our pilot some, some right. planning um, asks of them, but I would not. I mean, yeah, although I just, I'd love to move in that direction, I hate to ask them to come up with something, and we already have some predetermined outcomes. Okay. I was just thinking if this could be a vehicle, this section 17 could be a vehicle for more, for more, that's all. I don't know, committee. I like the way it's worded. I think it gives them flexibility to recommend whatever they think is the right way to go. Chris? In here, yep. Anthony, is that? Thumbs up. Oh, that's, I, I couldn't tell if it was a thumb or something else. Okay, all right. So, um, and let's go on then to the, where we start the EMS. Okay. Which if you're looking at the, um, the uh, bill itself, it starts on page 22. If you're looking at the, the um, summary, it's, on um, page five. Yeah. Okay. I've got them both up here. All right. Okay. Betsy. Madam Chair. Yes. Hi, uh, Matt Birmingham again. Yeah. If, if you're all set with me, I do have to get on another call. So I just wanted to make sure you're all set. Thank you. And we will um, send out the agenda for next week of which day we'll take this up. Great. Thank you all for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks for Thanks, joining Matt. us. Okay. All righty. So moving into EMS, the first thing that this would do is uh, throughout section 20, it would substitute the Department of Health for the State Board of Health so that it's the department that is the one that divides the state into EMS districts and issues licenses for ambulance services and first responder services. Um, this was proposed uh, by the Department of Health. I believe Dan was with us. Is he still with us? And Drew also was with us. Yes. Okay. So Dan, this came, actually came from you guys, right? That's correct. Okay. Are there any issues with this? Not from our standpoint. Um, I think what we're looking to do is make the process a little bit more nimble. Uh, yeah. The challenge of the Board of Health is they meet only so many times a year and um, I think we're a little closer to the organizations that we're able to have a better sense of what's right and what's wrong. Okay. All right, so are there any more comments on that one, Drew? 
So uh, just more of a question. So is there like an appeals process or how does, um, how does it work if say the, uh, the agency denies an application for license, where does that go? Is it a single person final word or is there a hearing process that's built into that? Um, this is the creation of the districts only, I think, at this but, point. But also the ambulance licenses. Where, which section is that? You can find that on page 25. Let me see. We'll find it exactly. Okay, but down to 25. Yeah, on page 25, oh, yeah. in line 17. Let's first of all, let's get rid of the the section above that down to this point. Is there are there any issues with that? That just transfers the um, to the Rich from Wyndham Superior Court. I'll call him back. Any issues with that down to and then starting on page 25 there on line seven is where. I think Drew is what you're talking about. Yeah, I guess the first question would be is, uh, are, is everyone comfortable with the Department of Health being the one dividing the state into emergency medical services districts rather, rather than the state board? And if there's an issue with that, that you know that very well that there's always the appeal to the legislature, which I believe is what happened before. Oh, no, that wasn't the division of the districts that was how okay different different issue okay everybody okay with that okay then let's go to the um line seven on page 25 yeah 17 yeah the next question would be with uh whether people are comfortable with the department of health being the entity to issue ambulance service and first responder service licenses rather than the state board so right now, Drew, your question was, was there an appeal process? Is there an appeal process right now through the state, if the state board makes the decision? So at this point, there's a, a process where we could go to the state board and um, you know, plead our case for or against a uh, license, should that you know, be appropriate or necessary. Uh, with the language switching to the Board of Health, does that mean that you know, Dan decides on his own and his, his, um, his decision is final. So, you know, we have a single person making a decision about an ambulance service uh, for a community. And I'm just making sure that there's a process in place so that, um, again. If I read lines 15 and 16, it says they have to develop rules for, um, for that, and I would assume that in rulemaking, there would be plenty of opportunity for um, input by the, the providers themselves and, the, and other people. Am I wrong about that? Is that right, Betsy? So you're looking at lines 15 and 16 of which page? Uh, 25. Okay, so that was in regard to another substantive issue, which was um, ambulance services in order to get licensed, um, not oh. discriminating. Um, similar to like how home health services cannot discriminate or uh, on the uh, uh, to whom they provide their services. Um, so I think it's a, a separate question. I think one of the places to look, oh. maybe I could look is to see whether there's um, any sort of rules right now that apply in regard to the process that the Department of Health has to use in making decisions and whether there's any appeal built in there. Um, I don't know the answer, um, but, but perhaps okay. it's another just question to have uh, DOH weigh in on, on whether there's anything uh, controlling Department of Health now on um, their issuance of decisions. Dan, do you know? 
There is, uh, I'm, I'm struggling right now to try to find it for you, but uh, there is an appeals process for licensing decisions. It uh, uh, would go back to the Board of Health right now, but I think we could mirror whatever existing rule there is within the, uh, the department so that it wouldn't be our office's decision, but an appeal could go to the commissioner. Uh, again, I, I don't want to promise be only because I need to know a little bit more about what our current and existing rules say, but okay. uh, I, I would not envision a system, I, I would not support a system where there was no appeals process. Okay. Okay, so we'll come, when we come back to this bill, we'll um, have some answers about how that would work. Okay. Any more questions on that one? If I don't see you raise your hand, yell at me because the sun is coming in really bright from this window and I can hardly see the screen. I'm sure you can hardly see me. I'm waiting for the clouds with the rain. Okay. All right. Um, I'll go to the next uh, thing on the list in the summary, which is eliminating the requirement for EMS personnel to be credentialed by their affiliated agencies. If you look on the summary, you can see I have that highlighted in yellow because you've already done this through S-182, which the governor signed into law yesterday. Um, just to put it on the committee's radar, then um, I sent DOH some potential language because we got feedback on the House floor when the House was considering S-182 as to whether uh, at least one of the eliminations of the credentialing requirement actually had a substantive change that wasn't intended about the ability of people to get a uh, license without examination. So I, um, I've followed up with the Department of Health on some potential language to fix that and also some other potential places to um, potentially maintain a requirement for EMS personnel to at least be affiliated with an affiliated agency in order to be licensed, um, even though the credentialing requirement's not there. So I uh, just, um, just to put that on the committee's radar that that might be, a there might need to be a fix that needs to be made. Um, and if so, I have the language that could potentially do that. And it, um, we could do that in this bill if I didn't know that this bill would actually move or another bill to do it in is in S-233, it seems like another potential vehicle. Well, we are hoping this bill will move. Okay. So that'd be a place to make that correction. Um, Dan, I had sent that draft language over and I know DOH is super busy. So, uh, but maybe we can figure out what if any fixes need to be made um, for S-182 um, in this bill. Dan? I, I did see it and I did read it and I'm sorry, I haven't gotten back to you yet. It seems like it's fine. I just wanted to do a little bit of a deeper read over before I got back to you. Drew? You're muted. Uh, what was the problem that was created? I guess I don't understand. So yeah, when we got rid of the credentialing requirement in S-182, there's one provision of the law in 18 BSA 906 subdivision 10 F that allows a person who is NREMT registered to get licensed without exam uh, if they're a National Guard medic or it said, or they're credentialed by an affiliated agency. When I remove the reference to credentialing, um, it was brought up on the House floor. Does that mean that only National Guard medics who are NREMT registered now can get licensed without exam? Is that eliminating the ability of other people who aren't medics to get licensed without exam if they're NREMT registered? So a potential language solution would be to say, you can get licensed without exam if you're NREMT registered and affiliated with an affiliated agency. And so then I looked through S-182 to see, oh my gosh, are there any other places where this is an issue? And um, so I sent some language over to see where we, if we need reference to being affiliated with an affiliated agency in other places where the law used to say credentialed by an affiliated agency. Because I think the big picture, right, is that a person can't get licensed as an EMS 
uh, EMS personnel and just go out and start practicing EMS without being affiliated with an ambulance service or a first responder service. Is that right? I, like I couldn't engage in solo practice. Now I'm going to go out and start being a paramedic on my own. Right. So that, just some potential technical corrections okay. that I didn't pick up when we were doing S-182. So I'm sorry for that. It's okay. We didn't pick it up when we were doing this either. <laughs> Yeah, we missed it twice. <laughs> okay. Why didn't the house just put a floor amendment on it then? Uh, they let it go. They did it. Um, the question was raised, but they sent it through all stages of passage that day. Um, okay. So, and that was, I think, maybe because they were considering that it as must pass legislation. Yeah. And, and it could be fixed. Yeah. And we, and because we do have permission to get this one going, so we can fix it here. Okay. Let's okay. fix it as much as possible. All right. I'm going to run a couple errands. And thank you for Dan. He just sent over um, by chat some info about uh, appeals. So I, I'll take a look at that reference. Thank you, Dan. But if we want to keep chugging along here. Yeah. I Let's had already mentioned um, that new requirement about uh, ambulance service license and renewal applicants needing to provide their services in a non-discriminatory manner, uh, similar to the requirement for home health services and requiring mm -hmm. Department of Health to adopt rules on that. Mm -hmm. And I guess okay. one thing just to, um, I, we passed, or you passed that out, um, but uh, just another look by DOH at that language um, to determine whether all that makes sense, the way that it's phrased, I think would be helpful. That language specifically appears on page 25, starting on line seven. And that was we going just to, want to make sure that there isn't cherry picking. Yeah, cherry picking, exactly. Um, all right, the next issue is extending ambulance license terms from one to three years. That's highlighted in yellow because you address that in S-182. Now that is the law. So my question, Betsy, about the ones that um, we've already done now, you'll prepare an amendment for us that removes those sections? I will. I'll, I'll do a strike all to get rid of all that language that's already been addressed in S-182 and okay. add whatever language you actually do want to move forward with from S-124. Well, I'm not so sure that we can do it that way because it's in appropriations. Mm -hmm. So I, um, it would have to be done as a strike off from them. Does it have so to I wondered, that way? Yeah. Um, I'm, I, I don't know, but unless we get it back, I don't think we could do a sub, they can do their amendment to their portion and then we would do a subsequent amendment, I would think, just taking those out, but we'll find out what the procedure is. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Uh, the next thing on the summaries highlighted in yellow is the Department of Financial Regulation enforcement of direct ambulance service provider insurance reimbursement. You did that mm -hmm. in S-182, that's taken care of. At the top of page six of the summary, if you're there, the next thing that the EMS uh, section would do is uh, require the Green Mountain Care Board to identify priorities regarding EMS resources and needs in the state's health resource allocation plan, the HRAP. And then related to that is a requirement in section 23 for the current EMS advisory committee to identify those resources and needs and report them to Green Mountain Care Board. Any issues on that? Okay. Uh, next, moving on, section 23 would require the Department of Health to establish by rule at least three levels of EMS instructors and the education required for each level. I'll just make a note that when you looked at the EMS provisions of S-124 to decide which ones you wanted to move forward with for S-182 that I, I, I recall Department of Health being concerned about putting additional obligations on them during the COVID 
outbreak. So just putting that back on your radar. Um, we have Dan here, but checking in with maybe what's what's feasible to get accomplished and by when. Dan, do you have a, any response? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not so much that we disagree with it. Um, in fact, in a, in a broad plan, we like the notion of dividing up the levels of instructor coordinator. The challenge, of course, is that by creating more uh, administrative levels of this and uh, having to create the, the rules that go along with it, we're going to make it more difficult, at least in the short term, to become an instructor coordinator. And uh, I'm a little concerned that my colleagues, especially in some of the underserved areas, will push back against that. Um, uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a bit of a tricky process as we as we develop a new system as we build a, a process and we have to orient people through it. That's going to be the challenge. Drew, do you want to comment? You're muted. I was looking to. You're. You muted yourself again. You unmuted and then muted. I'm good now. There you are. All right. Um, so can we leave this in and just extend the timeline so that we identify this as, as a priority? Just give us a little bit more time. The um, advisory committee's education um, subcommittee would be more than glad to take this project on and, and do a lot of the legwork. But I think it's important that we um, move forward with it, maybe just extend the timelines out so that we have a little bit more time to work on it. That makes sense to me. How about everybody else? Dan? Yeah, that's fine. I think that would make excellent sense and okay. I'd fully support that. Chris? Uh, all set, thank you. Anthony? Allison? Okay, great, good idea. What would be your okay. preferred date for these rulemaking requirements? Betsy, you're done. Ding, 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 ding. Requirements for DOH to adopt <laughs> rules on different subjects for. <laughs> <laughs> Betsy, you sound like a little ding dong, ding dong thing. <laughs> So what would what How about now? <laughs> now good. Better. Okay. Better. You do a great um, R two D two imitation every once in a while. So would uh, what is it currently? What is the date for that? For this July or? I, I think it's July one, twenty twenty one. I believe. Let me double check. Yeah, the, uh, so on page 41, starting on line 16, uh, all rules would need to be adopted right now by July 1, 2021. So that's final adoption. Um, and that's pretty much for everything, the multiple different subjects that DOH would need to adopt rules on. So I think it's just a question of, and so you want to at least provide an agency with six to eight months for rulemaking, and then they actually have to come up with a plan to get the rules going. So just a matter of counting, you know, how, how far out should this go? Is January 1, 2022 more reasonable? Why don't we maybe have Dan and Drew, um, Department of Health and the Advisory Council work together to come up with what would be a reasonable um, date for putting that in place. Does that make sense? I'm willing to, yeah, we can work out that and get back to you guys. Sure, okay. Thanks. All right. Um, moving on in section 23, um, 
in regard to eliminating the NREMT psychomotor skills testing for EMRs and EMTs. Um, so this would say, so right now the psychomotor exam is required for EMRs and EMTs and this proposed language in section 23 would allow either the demonstration of skills competencies or the NREMT psychomotor exam um, suffice to uh, test psychomotor skills of EMRs and EMTs. But then there's section 24, which is a future date that would say by July 1, 2021, the NREMT psychomotor exam is eliminated. Um, so it would just be demonstrating skill competencies to test the psychomotor skills of EMRs and EMTs. So maybe this is another place where we need to have some um, input on whether that's, uh, I think everybody agreed that that's something we should do, but whether that's a reasonable date by which to do it. I'd be willing to ask that question as well at our um, hold a meeting and find yep. out what the feeling is on date. Dan. Yeah, I, I'm much more concerned about this one um, uh, for a couple of reasons. Now, in principle, I agree, and uh, there, there's, it's not the idea of it that I that I um, am against. The hard part is the application of it is is complicated. Mm -hmm. um, the reason we have psychomotor testing right now is to assure competency, uh, and um, the reason we regulate it from the state is to assure that that competency is a uh, coming from a non-biased place. That is, um, there's a third party looking at and saying that uh, these folks are, are competent before they're walking out of the streets. Now, I would wholeheartedly agree, as a, as a former EMS educator myself, I would wholeheartedly agree that an educator knows more about the competency of a student than any test evaluator does in 15 minutes of a psychomotor exam. I, I understand that. However, um, there are any number of pressures associated with putting EMTs on the streets that make this really a little bit difficult, a little dangerous. Um, if we're leaving this in the hands, uh, I, I think we have excellent EMS programs in the state of Vermont, and there are a number of them that are very capable of doing this. We have some others that I'd be a little bit more concerned about who um, have have some some pushes, some some urgency to get folks out there that I'm not sure we can reliably count upon to say this is really a competent person beyond the push to get them out to the street. This is going to take some quality assurance. This is going to take some uh, building of capacity uh, before we can just say, sure, we we believe you. We're uh, we're confident that what you're doing is really getting folks out in the streets. So, so again, I'm, I'm, all, I'm not against it, but we definitely need to have some time on this one. Okay, so you guys will work together to come up with some, a time frame, And I assume that there are gonna be rules around this one also. And you'll come up with a time frame for when that could reasonably be accomplished. I'd be happy to, yeah. Okay, great. Okay. All right. The next thing that this bill would do is uh, require the Department of Health to establish by rule the entry level certification for what you called the new Vermont EMS first responder. And again, do we need to have an extended time period for that? So um, I've actually heard a lot of uh, feedback on this and um, a lot of requests from first response squads to make sure that this happens as soon as possible okay. uh, as a way to fill their ranks. So I would like to, to say that, you know, we should probably push, um, push forward with this level of first responders sooner than later to help out those departments that are struggling. And it's definitely something that uh, we'd be willing to work with the department on creating the curriculum and, and getting out sooner than later. So if we extend the time period on the others, maybe we don't need to extend the time period on this one. Dan? I'm not sure. What is the time period now? Do we Have we established that? that? What would the goal be? I think it's, again, the July 1, 2021 date. Yeah. Um, 
So the challenge of this level is that there is no existing national equivalent. Um, so that means there are no existing materials. There's no existing dedicated text. Now, I think we can adapt other resources to it, um, but there's a lot of moving parts to this one. Um, this isn't this isn't like we can just sort of uh, throw a class out there. We're going to have to build this from from scratch. So um, I'm not saying it couldn't be done by in a year, but it's that, that's there's a lot of moving parts. Um, it, ma it makes me concerned. Is this something that maybe the the National Guard or the um, uh, Red Cross or the Army? or somebody has um, something similar that, I don't know. So there are, there are definitely similar products. And I think probably the most promising way to do this would be to take an existing program and slim it down and utilize uh, resources that way. Um, but there's a lot of decision points. Um, uh, there's no psychomotor exam for this. We'll have to design. We'll have to design an exam, or we'll, we'll have to decide even if we are going to uh, have a psychomotor exam for this. There's no. Um, there's no cognitive exam. There's no questions uh, at any level uh, written for this. Um, any one of those things is is a big is a big deal, um, and uh, we're going to have to, like I said, we're going to have to build it from scratch. So that that just makes me nervous. So I would suggest perhaps that since this seems to be the one where there's the most um, pressure from the field, that we leave the date there. We ask the advisory council to work really closely with the Department of Health and try and advance this as much as possible. and. Um, I don't know where um, Pat Malone might fit in here in terms of advice and helping with this. And in January, we'll be back in session, presumably. And we can always extend that date if we need to. Anybody? That sounds Drew? good. And I, I think there's a, a group of people that are um, willing to put the time and work in that we don't have to task uh, more work to the health department than they can handle right now. Um, from what I've been getting for comments, I, I think there are people that are really willing to do the legwork, um, you know, with, with some direction to get this program off, uh, you know, off the ground so that we can get some responders. So I don't think it's uh, impossible. I agree with Dan, it's gonna be challenging, but I don't think it's impossible. And I think we do have the bandwidth amongst some of the leadership that are in these services to get it done. And we can always change that. We can always extend the, the date if we need to in January. I heard either Chris or Brian, I thought way in. But now I don't see either of them. I do see, so committee members weigh in. I think Allison's fallen asleep. <laughs> I already did. I'm fine with them. <laughs> did you, was that a little nap you just took? You're fine with it? Okay, Chris Bray. Yes, I am. I am also fine with it, and I'm not sleeping, but I'm just. Quiet. <laughs> Anthony, I saw you unmuted yourself. Yeah, no, I'm fine with it. It seems like a big job. But so leave the current date on there, trusting yeah. that there are we could change people it out there who yeah. are going to work really hard to help the Department of Health, and yeah. um, we can change the date later if we need to. Right. I, yeah, I think it's important to keep the date where it is, given how okay. important it is. All right. But uh, I, ha I am practicing keeping it on, you know, muted to try and satisfy my, you know, the, anyway, I'm trying we to be better about it. 
You don't have to keep it muted as long as you don't eat yogurt and clank on the dish. Well, have I not been better? You've been much better. All learn to be better on our Zoom experience with each other. I thought it was pretty funny yesterday when we were in the middle of a session and Chris Bray said, oh, excuse me, but I seem to be having some help from a dog outside. <laughs> I thought your, your hounds made perfect cheerleaders for your bill. <laughs> so that was, uh, you know, dogs outside sleeping for like three hours straight. The mailman comes. And <laughs> this, one of the two dogs is a little bit afraid of the mailman. So he starts barking. So the mailman decides that yesterday during my floor report is the moment to go into his bag, get dog biscuits and try to finally win over our dog, which makes him even more alarmed that he's, <laughs> that he's being approached by food by a relative stranger. So whatever. <laughs> okay. It was, it was charming. Well, I'm glad it wasn't Ooh, just- Ooh, we ah. just have lots of ambulances going by my house right now, Drew. Okay, um, let's move on. All right, next up is uh, the requirement for DOH to conduct sunset reviews of the continuing competency requirements. This is the same thing that you would re you required, proposed to require in S-233 for other professional regulatory entities. Uh, the language in the bill says that DOH would do its first review um, when it starts the rulemaking that's required by this bill. Okay. The next thing is uh, in regard to the EMS committee, advisory committee, and uh, establishing a new education council. So one of the first things about the existing advisory committee, it's just amending its report requirement to uh, require it to report on the annual number of mutual aid calls to an EMS area that come from outside the area. Um, it also, just to remind, requires the EMS advisory committee to identify those EMS resources and needs so the Green Mountain Care Board can consider and include them in the HRAP. But the more, most substantive thing is uh, requiring the EMS Advisory Committee to establish an EMS Education Council from among its members that would sponsor or approve EMS training or education programs and provide advice to DOH regarding standards for licensure. Dan. So we, we would, although I, uh, we support the notion of building the EMS uh, Education Council, uh, that's something that I think makes good sense. Uh, we would not support the notion of them approving classes uh, on their own. Um, approval of classes right now is managed by the Department of Health. Uh, again, it creates an impartial process uh, uh, where uh, the specific uh, biases and concerns of local agencies are not influencing into this process of approval. Um, I think this process would be, uh, uh, would be potentially fraught with some dangerous circumstances um, and also a, a good bit of conflict of interest uh, when we start talking about putting folks who are actively teaching programs into the approval process. Um, there's still, at this point, plenty of input into the approval process, uh, and we'd be welcome. We would welcome their uh, uh, this council's, this new council's uh, input into the approval process. But I think the the final say in approval should stay in the hands of the Department of Health. Drew. Um, so I don't have a strong. Uh, opinion on the final approval, but I would say I, I do believe that the EMS advisory committee is um, represents uh, all stakeholder groups and all districts in a very non-biased way. So whatever um, job the committee is tasked with will be um, done in, in that fashion. So as far as input into education, the testing um, curriculum of education, I think the EMS advisory committee setting up an education um, group to review that is an excellent idea and completely support that. So if, if that education came through the 
EMS uh, Education Council and had final approval at the uh, Department of Health, I wouldn't object to that. Uh, Betsy Ann? Would it make, um, would it help clarify if the, if you want to move forward with this uh, Education Council um, uh, offering these programs, would it be better if the language were clarified to say that the Education Council shall seek um, certification or uh, approval from DOH so that uh, DOH puts final, um, gives final approval that the education that's offered is uh, meets DOH standards for these education courses? I think you would also want to have input from the council into the, into the uh, curriculum. And I, I, I'm not sure, Dan? I, I would happily uh, work with the advisory committee to, to make sure okay. that that committee, that subcommittee has a, a, an appropriate role in a course approval. If they want to appoint a couple of rotating members to work on all course approvals to give us input uh, into that process, I'm absolutely fine with that. I, I think we do have to acknowledge that there are a number of different sponsors of education, of EMS education in Vermont. Um, and uh, although I think there is a role for some central sponsorship, we want to also protect the other organizations like the University of Vermont and Vermont Technical College who might continue to want to do this independently of any central, uh, central places. So um, uh, although I think, I think it is appropriate that this, this Education Council could develop education and be a sponsor in and of itself, I think we need, just need to make sure that there's room for others in that mix as well. So can we ask you to work together on some language here so that the, the, we create the Education Council and they have um, figure out what their role is in sponsoring and um, having input into, into the education programs and the, is that something? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. And Drew, you're okay with that? Yes, we can. Uh... I'll add that to the list and we'll get right on it. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right, in the summary, if you're following along there, I'm at the top of page seven. Um, this would just add that new certified Vermont EMS first responder and the current licensed EMRs to the current financial allocation. So you can find this on in section 25 of the actual bill. Um, this amends the statute that describes what the current funding source or who the fun current funding source is for. Um, right now it says that it's for the training of EMTs, advanced EMTs and paramedics. So this would add in the current EMRs to that and then also add in uh, the new certified EMS first responders to the entities that can get um, training funded. Okay. All right. And then the last big thing that this bill would do is uh, make the appropriation for EMS training. Uh, your bill as passed out of committee said it was the $450,000 from the EMS special fund and the $400,000 from the general fund. And I suspect that appropriations will probably change that given what we've just, um, what they're dealing with right now. I'd rather they deal with the 3.9 million than 400,000. So for the bill, for the rewrite, should I, how would you like me to handle that? I would, I would check with, um, uh, let me check with Jane and Tim and, um, Secretary Bloomer and see what's, what do you think committee? I, I think rather than us, I, I don't know that we can do a strike all because we don't have it. And I don't necessarily want the strike all to come from the appropriations committee because then that means they would be reporting out all of those changes. So what I would think is that we would present this bill on the floor just um, not reporting on the sections that are to be just saying this will be taken care of in an amendment, then appropriations would do their amendment, whatever that is. And then we would have 
another amendment afterwards. Allison? So I, I think given how much how much we're altering this bill and how much we've taken out, it wouldn't be it, it would be appropriate if you wanted to ask for it back uh, for us to, in light of the changes we made as a result of the COVID priorities, for us to uh, I mean there are enough things we're looking at adding that and there we altered the finances so completely through uh, our other bill uh, and through your letter. Um, in, in, in your request, I would think it would be appropriate for us to take this back and uh, make those alterations. Okay, we could, I, I will ask if that's a possibility without us then not meeting crossover. Right, I, I understand, but gosh, the work, you know, we responded to COVID needs immediately through this bill. And yeah, I think it's only fair for them to let us rework it a little bit with a short time frame. Uh, I will check I will check that out, Betsy Ann. And I'll I'll try and get a whole uh, get a decision made by um, sometime Monday afternoon. Yeah, because I just think it would be simpler. Yeah. I, I think in the long run it would be a simpler solution. It would it would be simpler if we could do that and just have a strike all. Right. And who knows what the secretary will come up with. He always has another card or two up his sleeve on how to do something procedurally. <laughs> this That's is true. true. Brian? I'm fine with going that way too. Okay. Anthony? Yeah, no, I, I don't know what the other choices would be. I mean, that would work any better. Mm -hmm. I really don't. I mean, we couldn't inject the higher amount of money into the bill that's in, that they're already looking at. Right. We, I think we have to, to, that would be the other option would be to say, well, we don't want the 400,000, whatever we want, the 3 million. But it makes more sense to bring it back to us. And then just not, and to make all, do a strike all, make all the changes and not even put in the appropriation because we've already put that right. in. Right. Yeah. yeah. We, we hopefully, hopefully it will have been dealt with. <laughs> We're hoping. Okay, anybody else? Uh, Betsy? This, section 27 just provides the transitional provisions in regard to the EMS portion of the bill. So it's just setting up the deadlines that things need to happen. Um, basically the July 1, 2021 deadline. So I can go back and revise that with whatever the appropriate dates are that um, are recommended. Okay. So I will try to have this um, a decision made on this by Monday afternoon so that we can then get um, the, whatever draft we need and then everybody can look at the, because we are going to need to hear then a little bit from um, the training council and the commissioner and um, DOH and the, EMS Advisory Council. Right. Yeah, because Dan. Huh? And the um and the uh, instructor the instructor Pat wasn't Pat also going to weigh in on some stuff? If if he cares to. But the, there's a, so all the rest of the bill and and Jeffrey Wallens we were also going to hear right. from him on that section so that we'll take this up again. Um, Probably next, is Friday a decent day for people? Sure. Every day with you is a decent day. Friday's fine. Yeah, it's okay. It's Damn just like Drew. Tuesdays anyway. Huh? All my days are Tuesdays. They just all blend together. Oh, I, I am fatigue, fatigue. Yeah. I, I had no idea this was going to be, I mean, and I, we're not in any different position than anybody else that's doing this, but I had no idea it was going to be so fatiguing, but yep. I'd rather suffer cabin fever. Okay, and, and Dan it. and Drew, is you know Friday a good day? Betsy? Oh, sorry. Betsy Ann, is Friday a decent day? Oh yeah, def definitely. Okay. There is one other portion of the bill I was just going to remind. There's the last portion of the bill is public safety planning. 
Yes. Oh, I'd right, like right, right, right. I'd like to we have come there. Okay, great. Okay, let's finish that. Okay. So section 28 would require towns to have the town public, uh, town public safety plan. And it just piggybacks off of the current requirement for towns to do an annual assessment of their capacity to respond to all hazard incidents. They already have to do that annually. So just kind of piggybacks off of that process and requires them to have a public safety plan. That's probably something VLC team want to weigh in on. I think they felt much better about it once we did this than required it as part of their town plan. And then the last part of the bill, um, or well, I'll just mention that those public safety plans, every town would be required to have one by July 1, 2023. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last part of the bill is the ACCV public safety planning grants, where there'd be a $100,000 appropriation to ACCD in fiscal year 21 for three public safety planning grants. Uh, the bill provides that regional organizations can apply for them. A uh, grant would be for a max of three years and not exceed $35,000. They'd have to go to different geographic regions of the state and report annually to the GovOps and appropriations committees on um, how it's going with their public safety planning and provide data. Are we still okay with this committee? This, this, this is our, our pilots on regional uh, emergency, ser uh, regional emergency services, right? It could be, yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. Doesn't it spell it out of, it doesn't, yeah. not in the summary, but it does in the bill. It's for three public safety planning grants. Sure. Yeah, it's three pilots, I think it's great. And it's pretty um, bare bones funding. It's pretty modest. Yeah. In it in, in light of the need. Uh, well, anyway, I, I think that's one of the things we might discuss is actually the funding. Um, I, I, yes, Brian. No, I was going to say today. No, no. Oh, thank you. No, not today. Okay. So we have a list of questions that we need to get answers to. And I will try to schedule this, I believe on Friday to give time for everybody to weigh in and think about it and, okay? Okay. No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Polina has said. I have to say that, um, Sometimes committee members are more quiet in this format than in others, but I like the format of not having somebody testify and then somebody testify and then go. I like the format of kind of having a more open discussion and having people have input rather than um, the more formal testimony, especially when we're just doing this kind of discussion so i have had the other experience though where if something is controversial and people are feeling a little disputatious <laughs> that going good word back to the testifying in sequence thing helps settle things back down and, and then you go to discussion mode but i agree testimony in sequence is not ideal for sorting anything out right like witness one, does do people remember what witness one says when witness <laughs> twenty just finished? You know, it's tricky. And we usually are pretty good, actually, about having kind of these kinds of discussions afterwards, even even in our more formal committee meetings. But I I do appreciate people being patient and um, willing to to do it. So. You run such a fine establishment. That's why so many people hang out and send it <laughs> even when they don't have a bill. Right, right. <laughs> well, particularly, Chris, Christopher Bray, now that you're providing such vistas for us to enjoy. I know. I, I could get something new. That one. This is beautiful. Do we see the, is, is it looking east or west? That is looking southwest from uh, Bristol Mountain. And right behind me, those little dots are the 
uh, houses in the here. I'll lean some more. Oh yeah, the, there. The little dots are the that's the village. And then Anthony has his flowers that we can enjoy. Yes. Yeah, I want a little greenhouse, but uh -huh. most of the flowers went outside today because it actually oh. sort of warmed up. So they're enjoying themselves outside, waiting. Well, actually, it's starting to rain. So now they're enjoying the rain. <laughs> Just in time that we're going to finish up. So I was going to go outside and walk around a little bit. And now it started to rain. Okay. You can always walk around Anthony with an umbrella. This is and true. your iPad. This is true. Anyway, thank you, okay. Madam Chair. I think this is was good. It was good to All get right. our it was good to get our heads back in these other pieces of this bill. So I will send out a, a, a proposed um, schedule for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of what we're going to be doing. So uh, sorry, I, I hate to ask this, but um, it's the end of the week. Have we heard anything about the resolution on our elections uh, work? Uh, we have, I got a, uh, some information today from Chris that they're still working on it and, um, we're, we will take that up on Tuesday because that is, we had sort of set yeah. that as, yeah, it kind and, of runs out of time. I know. Well, he asked that we take it up on Tuesday. Did, did, um, Ms. Rask draft that version, a, a draft, a version? She probably did. I do. I have okay. some language, but I'm still working with the Secretary of State's office on uh, what would be appropriate from their perspective. Okay. Yep. I wanted to double check, make sure I hadn't missed an email with something in process. Thanks. Okay, anything else, committee? Have a good weekend. Gail, do you have anything we need to be aware of? Uh, no. Just waiting to hear what next uh, week's schedule is going to be. Um, okay, um, we do. We did have, and so we've gotten permission to deal with all of the bills that we think we need to deal with so far. I did get a um, an email from Greg Knight asking us to deal with the Provost Marshall bill. I don't have a clue what that's about, but he thinks it, he said it's important. So um, I, we will schedule him to come in and talk to us so we can see if, um, okay. And then on Tuesday, we might be looking at some, um, but if there are budget requests that we need to address besides and EMS. Did you get permission for the Weathersfield charter so we could move ahead on that? So we'll vote, yeah. we'll, we're gonna work on that on Tuesday? We can. That's not a. Um, that's not a. A must pass right away. Right. I, I just. It's they curious. Just, We're going to vote on it on on uh, when whenever we met. <laughs> Remember, we were going to vote on that, but you hadn't gotten permission to. Right, and we we can we can vote on it, but. Um, it, it isn't a must pass. So I'm trying to figure out like these budget things. If we need to get requests in for budget adjustment, we need to Got do it. those things first. Okay. Great. All right. Okay. Okay. Everybody Thank have a good you. weekend. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Have a Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Tomorrow is good.